Yeah. Oh boy, this is a good Midwestern audience. We'll do this out of their traditions. In California, they wouldn't say a word. We <laughs> <laughs> can't tell Californians. I got your back, sir. I got your back. <laughs> um, the title of my talk uh, is on my slide, and I guess I don't have any slides. It's the convergence of design and management. Don't worry, I didn't get, I didn't bring any. I don't use slides. I, I'm one of the few designers that never use a slide or a PowerPoint, and that's going to be very frustrating. So I ask you to indulge me with this. I just have a question. Do you know Edward Tuffy? So yes. Who says we shouldn't use slides? Yes. <laughs> uh, I don't have the highest regard for it. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, again, the convergence of management and design. But I, uh, I'm going to make some remarks leading up to this. Uh, I understand that the purpose of this is to engage you and show you some things that we're doing right now at the Weatherhead, so that that's relevant to your field, to your backgrounds, to things you've learned in the EDM, and to what will be coming in the DM program. Uh, so I'm delighted to share some recent developments, things that are happening in schools and management around the country, actually around the world, and also similar things <coughs> happening in great schools of design around the world. There are quite a number of schools beginning to explore this convergence. In fact, in June, we're going to hold a conference here, of, uh, an international conference. We've invited 70 distinguished people to come and discuss the, the nits and grits, the details of how you bring design into management school and management into design school. So this is really an emerging explosive moment, I think, and it's a great moment. So having you here at this time is, is really terrific. Uh, I flew back uh, this morning from uh, St. Louis. Last night there was a wonderful lecture by uh, uh, Wilm Aretz, a great uh, Dutch uh, architect, who was asked to be the, the respondent to Wilm's remarks. And, uh, he's a delightful man and does wonderful work. But in the context of that, of that uh, event last night, I learned from one of my friends, the, the dean down at Wash U, that David Orr has sunk into a fairly serious depression. Um, David Orr, you understand, is one of the, the wonderful articulate speakmen, spokesmen for issues of sustainability and ecological uh, matters. His book, Ecological Literacy, may be maybe the best book on the subject uh, around. Certainly, his chapter two is the best discussion of the concept of sustainability that I've ever seen. It's a very intelligent, philosophically focused, practical discussion of the varieties and subtleties of the meanings of sustainability. I bring up sustainability, of course, because our, I think some, is it hard to hear? No. No, oh, but it is for him. Can you make sure the microphone's on? I have no idea. There should be a green light. Well, it there's no light. It's kind of red right now. There you go. Oh, that's green. Okay. All right. What technology. Thank you, Boo. What a great thing. Uh, so as I said, uh, the, uh, the work of uh, uh, David Orr is so important in the field, but that he has sunk into a deep depression, um, a discouragement. Um, he's been a leader, I think, in many ways, the intellectual movement surrounding sustainability, and it was troubling to, to learn this. Of course, the situation is troubling, generally. But our program that we're putting together, the PhD extension of the Doctor of Management, it concerns the uh, uh, design of sustainable systems. And you've already heard discussions of sustainability and of systems, and I understand it was a very provocative discussion from, uh, from David. I, uh, I was counting on that. I'm gonna add to the provocation. Uh, the reason I bring up David Orr is, is that the issue of sustainability is central in my work as well, but my focus is on the sustainable human systems that we create. Sustainability has a variety of meanings and or is articulate in explaining those, but my concern is with sustainable human systems. And uh, in, that, in that context, design plays a central role for me. So I'm gonna be talking about not all systems, but human systems, principally human systems. Before that though, I have a text from the Bible 
to read you. This is from uh, a, a, one of the late plays of William Shakespeare. And I hope you'll indulge me if I read something from The Winter's Tale. Uh, it may not be clear at the beginning why this is significant. It may not be clear at the end why this is significant. But someplace in the middle, it may have some relevance. So let me read this passage to you. Now, Perdita, you'll understand, is the 16-year-old daughter of Leontes, one of the kings. And she has been cast aside, picked up by a shepherd, as always goes in these plays, and raised as a, as a, as a shepherd's daughter, a sweet young thing. And she's going to talk about the flowers in her garden. This is in Act 4. Do any of you know the play? Some do. Oh, you do. Good, good. Anyone else? Gosh, I, when I was teaching this to my uh, undergraduate class, I've been using it, uh, teaching a course in systems thinking. And I use this as the culminating text in the systems thinking class. And I, I'm figuring no one has read Shakespeare at all. So I ask, every hand was up. And I said, well, you've read uh, Julius Caesar. And they all said, yes. And Macbeth, yeah. And I said, have you read others? And all the hands went up again. They'd all been reading Shakespeare. It's amazing to me. No one else had read The Winter's Tale, though. The Winter's Tale is a, is a mature, as we say, mature text. Let me read this, though. Perdida, the 16-year-old, she's talking about the flowers that grow in her garden in that decisive fourth act. <laughs> she says, of trembling winter, the fairest flowers of the season are carnations and streaked gillivores. I don't know what a gillivore is, but it's streaked which some call nature's bastards. Of that kind, our rustic garden's barren, and I care not to get even slips of them. Polixenes, Perdita's father's friend, although still no one knows who each other is, typical Shakespeare, Polixenes happens to be there, and he says, whereof, gentle maiden, why do you neglect them? And she said, for I have heard it said that there is an art which in their piedness, the streaked quality, shares with great creating nature. That there is an art in the, the variegation of the colors that shares with the art of great creating nature. There's more to come. Polixenes says, so there be. Yet nature is made better by no mean but nature makes that mean. So or that art, which you say adds to nature, is an art which nature makes. You see, sweet maid, we marry the gentler scion of the wildest stock and make conceive a bark of baser kind by bud of nobler race. This is an art which does mend nature, nay, not mend, but change nature. That the art itself is nature. What's happening at Weatherhead today is that we are exploring the art of management. We have found that that art has grown stale and uh, it no longer functions successfully in the, the community of for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. There is a need to regenerate a noble art of management. And we believe that the part of that task of regenerating the art of management is to bring design thinking into it. Design as a creative art. And you can already get a sense of the connection that I'm going to make back to the Shakespeare. But the exploration that has to go beyond the, the, the glib generality of some relationship between the two. In fact, that's why we're having the conference in June. Because while there is discussion around the world that well, a sort of a recognition, well, maybe there is some place for design in management. That's the is it phase, does it exist? There's some recognition that it exists. Uh, Roger Martin writes on and on about this and, and others. But the next question that has to come, if it exists, what is it? What do we actually mean when we talk about bringing design thinking into the practices of management? And I would carry that further. What do we mean by the art of management in schools that have based their educational systems on analytics and not on the synthetics of management?
I want to begin with a discussion of what I mean by a system <coughs> and what I don't mean by it from a designer's point of view. Designers uh, certainly are concerned with systems and there are books recently uh, that discuss systems thinking and design thinking. But I have to say that uh, for a designer, we are troubled by the use of the word system, many of us. System doesn't bring anything new to the table that doesn't already exist in other concepts of wholeness. The concept of community, the concept of organization, the concept of form, the concept of structure. All of these are synonyms for the concept of system. In a sense, we have old wine in new bottles. There are, however, a few elements that make it useful to discuss systems today. From a design point of view, we would say that every product we make is a system, if it's a successful product. It's successful if it integrates all of the parts into a functioning whole, and that wholeness is a system. So you might think for yourself, what are the other words we use for wholeness, or what is a, a wholeness? in whatever discipline you may consider. Order, the word order also can stand for system. No difficulty in that. The sense of system sometimes suggests complexity. And designers deal with complexity, certainly. There are very few products that are not complex matters. Typically, we find products to be a synthesis of technological reasoning, the, the guts of a product, what makes it work. And that isn't just an artifact. The guts of what makes it work can be an information presentation. You mentioned Tufty, and Tufty spends some time articulating that, that logos, the, the logic of communication. It can exist in interaction products, the digital products around us. There is certainly a, an architecture of intelligibility in products, and you know this very well from Ford. I, good to see you here again. In fact, it's good to see so many of you who have been with me before. <coughs> In fact, it's the range of products that designers make that sets the agenda for the convergence of design and management. And our work here at the Weatherhead, I think, can be characterized in two ways, two streams of thought. The first is relatively obvious. We think it's important that people who are going to manage in the world understand the role of the display of information, graphic design, the product development process, typically associated with artifacts, but not always and not only. And third, familiarity with the design of actions, interactions, I'll say it, services. 80% of the economy is services. And although people in Cleveland still think manufacturing is coming back here, I'm waiting for the laughter, yes. It's coming back, all right, it's coming back to Vietnam and China and Thailand. It ain't coming back here, folks, I'm sorry. We're going to build our economy here out of services and information. In any case, our task first is to ensure that managers understand the value and importance of these three kinds of products in their work. How do you use information and visualization to communicate message to customers to, and internally? How do you use that in the most powerful ways? Second, do you understand product development, how products come to be, that they don't fall off of trees, that as a manager, you're obligated to understand the steps in product development and how to harness the resources. In fact, you may well be charged with developing a product and understanding how that works, that it's not just a casual matter of waving a hand, is an important matter. The third in services, very likely as a manager, you'll be asked to assess and probably to develop services to strengthen them. I recently got, uh, had a long telephone inquiry from one of the banks discussing the nature of their services. I was astonished because I thought banks didn't care at all. This bank cared a great deal. They were subtle questions, questions that could only have been framed with a design mind behind it because they clearly wanted to improve the quality of service in that bank. I was impressed. I haven't taken an account yet, but I was impressed. Services are coming up everywhere. That's the first part of what we do. We want students coming out of the program who don't look simply at the financials, who don't look simply at the human relations that are part of their company. P. 
people who can begin to think about the actual products and services that drive an organization, that make an organization valuable. That's a, an important enough goal in itself, but we have a further one that's emerging with us. Our interest now is in a fourth kind of product. How do we use design thinking, the methods and concepts of design practice, in the art of management to shape the organizations in which we live and work? Is it possible that if we thought about the activities that constitute the structure of an organization, structure, remember the code word for system, if we thought carefully about how we create those activities, how we assess them and how we improve them, if we use design concepts and design methods, and I'll say some techniques as well, can we improve the quality of organizational life? That's the bigger agenda that we have here. I want to be very clear about this because you'll find a number of business schools around the world that are beginning to talk about the importance of graduates understanding product development. In fact, that's the focus of the Rotman School. They work with product development. They have a studio, as we have a studio here, by the way, but we don't do just product development. There are a few other places that do, do strategy work, taking the perspective of a designer on competitive product positioning, use design thinking to assess the market, the technological capability to understand how companies can direct their, their work and redirect their work. Strategy, an important part of organizational process. But these schools, we think, neglect the higher use of design. And it's that use of design that we think relates back to an art of management. And I'm very deliberate in saying art here, and by art I mean a systematic practice. I'm not talking about touchy-feely things. I'm talking about a systematic practice. Intellectual and practical. In fact, in the master's program at the Weatherhead now, you may already know this, I, I'm not sure, probably you do, we are teaching a uh, design course as the culminating capstone of the MBA experience. It's a year-long course and students are led through a design process and they create products and services or strategies. They use design thinking. That's the practical side of bringing design into a management school to teach young, young adults how to think creatively about products and services in their environments. They work with sponsors, not clients. We're anxious that we not put the student into a client relationship because, to be really honest, I think the clients don't understand. And we don't want them to crush the students too quickly with their own entrapment. In fact, in the projects that we're doing, we're doing six big projects, at least two of the sponsors we're working with will be surprised by the results back. They're expecting an analytic in a traditional MBA report, and they're not going to get it. They're going to get insight into their organization, but it's not going to be what they expect. And frankly, I'm pleased with that. I know those, those two organizations, and they need some new thinking. That's the practical side of it. At the doctoral level, though, we also think that design can be a strategy of inquiry, that it can shape research itself. And this is what you all know about very well. You've gone through your quantitative and qualitative analyses. You've begun to write the integrative papers, and I know that some of you are now publishing, or trying to publish, and will publish, as you continue your own inquiries. And that's what makes us as faculty at the Weatherhead feel very delighted with this program. It's had a reputation for turning out really excellent scholars. It's got a great reputation in this respect. <laughs> but our interest is in bringing more design thinking into this process. And how to do it is a great challenge. I mentioned the kinds of products that designers create. They create information in communication, it serves the purposes of communication. And those of you who had my course, you understand that at the beginning of the 20th century, this was fundamentally a problem of mass communication. 
the rise of the printing presses and the availability of uh, new technologies that enabled mass communication with magazines and newspapers, use of images and so forth, choice of fonts, just an explosion of needing people who can design information presentation. At the same time, possibly even a bit earlier, industrial design rising, the need for mass production. Uh, and it may be interesting to you to know that within 500 miles of Cleveland, more than half of the industrial design programs in the United States are located. Within 500 miles of here, maybe a little less, as far west as Milwaukee and Chicago, as far south as St. Louis, coming across to Cincinnati, certainly at uh, Champaign-Urbana, coming across to Columbus and Pittsburgh, and going north to Toronto and Carleton, those and others, those are the great design schools of the 20th century, the great industrial design programs. Why are they there? Because manufacturing was there. Duh, of course. Westinghouse, just outside of, uh, of uh, Pittsburgh. Here, Cleveland, you know the companies. Bedrock companies, manufacturing companies, hard metals. <coughs> Also in this 500 mile sweep, you will find some of the very best business schools in the country. Not an accident, not an accident. The design schools, the business schools. But what do we do now? When I was in Cincinnati, uh, not Cincinnati, excuse me, St. Louis yesterday, last night, I'm flying too fast, <laughs> the city's it looks pretty good. There are things that have come in, but you know, they're losing population. They used to be the sixth largest city in the world with 800,000 people. They're now down to about 300,000, and they're losing population still. Just like Pittsburgh, like Cleveland, not Chicago, but those cities losing. They're losing because the jobs aren't here and people have to move elsewhere to look for work. What will be our regeneration? Where will we find <coughs> growth in this region? It's our belief here, I think, and I'm still working to convince some of my outlying colleagues on this, including those in the, uh, in the uh, CIA, one or two people aren't sure about this. There's still some sense that manufacturing is coming back. But if we can start to teach design thinking shaped around information, services of all kinds, we may have an opportunity to create new kinds of industries. I'll tell you right now, they are going like a house of fire in Cincinnati. Uh, P&G has had uh, great influence there and the spin-off companies and uh, design consultancies, they, uh, p and is now a service company. Procter & Gamble is a service company. Hard to believe that. It's the mind shakes a little bit to think about this. And I have to say that there is a sense in which even the automobile industry is now a service industry. The integrations of technology, of information display and presentation, the use of information from, from engine, engine characteristics, uh, running capabilities and so forth, it's an integrated product. It's become a very complex system. It's our hope that we will cultivate a kind of entrepreneurship at the master's level and that our work at the doctoral level will open pathways in new kinds of innovation for our region and for other parts of the country. Frankly, that is the future. There is no other future. I'm sorry, that's it. Youngstown is making a, a, a move to develop a software industry. They have an incubator facility, which is going rather well, I have to say. They've had tough times, but they also are digging in, in their ways. And we are, I think, in this region, beginning to do that, that effort. But we need people in organizations who understand the innovative possibilities of what new products and services can mean for us what they can mean for the consumer, what they can mean for ordinary human services from government to make a vital region.
That's why we teach the master students to think of new products, think of new ways of conceiving products. The practices of design are rich with invention tools, tools that frankly have been neglected within management schools for too long. The art of management has ground down in many ways. Herb Simon used to complain, argue, complain, Herb never complained, he argued. He argued that engineering had retreated uh, away from the shop floor, had gone into the back room with mathematicians and physicists. And he was right. He said it's time for engineering to come back to the floor. And those lectures in 67 and published in 68 were the kickoff at MIT and at Carnegie Mellon and a number of other institutions to bring engineering back to the engagement with products. Something like that is what we're after here too. To bring our organizations back into contact with the products and services that drive our organization. That's the what of our program. And we think there's lots of room for research into the nature of these new products. In fact, as I've looked over, <coughs> excuse me, as I've looked over many of your uh, thesis works, I see the threads that I could easily construe as design thinking. Not quite got all the conceptual framework, but touching on these issues and beginning to provide a body of evidence about the nature of innovation. Not every project, I have to admit this. There's nothing wrong with that, but a significant number. <coughs> you bet. It's pretty powerfully. Um, I don't know whether to take that on right now, but I would say that's an activity to be designed. Okay. I'll just, for, for right now, leave it that way. Okay. But I think that any of the business functions that you know about, they've been designed by chance or by deliberate thought. And sales is one, I think, where there is an effort to redesign that in some companies around the country. I've been watching the use of technology to improve uh, sales relations to customers. <laughs> the linkages that are possible. Again, the growing complexity of systems that we deal with. So it's one of many examples, though, of a business process that can be subjected to design thinking. But, but it strikes me that most management schools don't teach in their undergraduate or in their MBA curriculum sales. They teach marketing and accounting and you know, finance or whatever. But, but it's interesting that the sales skills themselves have been left to be learned That's right. That's right. That's right. How to turn that into a subject for inquiry using design? Yeah, there's something exciting in that, I think. <coughs> I chose the Winter's Tale for a reason, and I'm going to try to explain to you a little more about why I chose that. The passage I read to you was is probably cryptic. I had a feeling it would be obscure at the beginning and obscure at the end and somewhere in the middle. But let me tell you the plot. Because <laughs> I think this plot tells us something significant. The story begins with two kings who are spending several months together, Leontes and Polixenes. And Leontes' wife, Hermione, is there. And it comes time for one of the kings to return to his kingdom. And Leontes says, oh, please stay. Please stay. Stay another month. Stay a while longer. He asks him several times, eight times, ten times. Each time, Polixenes says, no, I got to go, got to go. Polixenes accepts it and goes off to talk to one of his ministers. But Hermione comes over and sits down with, with uh, Polixenes and says, please, stay with us. Stay another month. You can take a little more time. My husband would love you to be, be here. She asks him once or twice, <clears throat> and he says, okay, I'll do it. All this happens in the first, oh, page of text, page and a half, the big pages. 
Polixenes walks back in and, uh, and she delivers the good news. He's going to stay. Leontes, well, I asked him, thinking to himself, I asked him ten times. You've asked him only once or twice. And he looks down at Hermione and he realizes that she's pregnant. And he connects the pregnancy with her request for the other king to stay. And the seed of jealousy is born. And from that moment on, within just minutes of the beginning of the play, Leontes goes, I can't say he goes mad, because I want to be very careful about this language that we use. But he persists in this notion of jealousy. So much so that he asks his trusted servant, Chamberlain or some high official, to kill Polixenes. He can't do that. So he flees with Polixenes back to the other's kingdom. In the meantime, Hermione is set for persecution by Leontes. He says, you're a whore. It's not my child. I even doubt the child that I have here. Maybe that's not my child. Imagine this, this, this play beginning on a moment of joy and celebration, an organization that's healthy and wealthy. And in the space of just two or three pages, begins a rapid descent. It takes three acts for this to work itself out. Three acts out of a five-act play. And by the end of the third act, Hermione is on trial for her life. The baby has been sent off to be abandoned on the shores of a, of a lake, a river or something. And Leontes, being the wise manager, oh, ruler, that he, uh, that he thinks he is, he says, I'll tell you what, we'll ask the gods for their judgment too, because I want to be fair. So he sends off to Apollo, and they carry back Apollo's judgment. And Leontes says, now I will be vindicated. You've called me a tyrant, but I will be vindicated. They open the oracle. And let me say this. You all know Jerry Springer, don't you? <laughs> I think you do. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. You do know him, don't you, Mike? <laughs> the plot structure in Jerry Springer often is to bring in a man and a wife, and there's a child. Who is the father? And the DNA test is done, and Jerry opens up and says, you are not the father. Disaster. Well, the Oracle of Apollo is a DNA test. It's Shakespeare's equivalent of a DNA test, because Apollo is with the gods and with nature. And Apollo has sent the word back, she's innocent, it's your child. He goes berserk. Can you imagine Jerry Springer, if he, Jerry says, this child is your child by DNA testing. And the father re refuses to take, to accept the DNA test. We think that'd be foolish, don't we? Certainly. At the moment that he repudiates the DNA test, uh, Apollo's message, at the moment he repudiates it, there's a lightning storm, and word comes back that his firstborn son has died. Hermione collapses, apparently dead. His daughter has been sent off to the shores and abandoned, apparently to be eaten by wolves or mice or whatever, whoever eats things out there. And it ends as an absolute tragedy absolute disaster in three acts. Now, you know Shakespeare, it usually takes him five acts to get there. But he was really fast on this one, and there's got to be a reason. And I'm wondering, what can it be? What can it be? Act four, act four and act five are totally different. Act four begins not in the, 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 uh, the, the court of the king. It begins in the, the countryside. You know, the Shakespearean comedies always occur in the countryside. There are flowers and nymphs and all kinds of good things. It begins there. And we see Perdita, the daughter who was abandoned. Actually, she's been raised by the shepherd, and she's given flowers to everyone. They're shearing sheep, and all this great stuff is going on. And that's when this passage occurs that I tell you about. Because by chance, 
Polixenes, the, the king, is wandering around trying to figure out who is this girl his, father, his son has been seeing. Well, it turns out it's the shepherd girl, Perdita, of course. In any case, <coughs> Polixenes suddenly discovers that it's this girl that his son wants. And he does something really unwise also. He says, I disown you. You will not inherit the kingdom. You will not inherit any money. I cast you out. An echo of the earlier mistake. So the daughter and the, and the boy flee. They go back, guess where? Back to the earlier kingdom. And they meet the, meet the king and so forth. Turns out in Act 5, they bring in a, a statue. They take the king, Leontes, who's really, he spent 16 years of misery, just totally destroyed in some ways, nothing, a shell of a man. Take him to see a statue. The statue is a statue of Hermione. And in the corniest of all possibilities, the statue comes to life. Now, we find it corny, I, I'll grant you this. But I wonder about the art of the sculpture in this. And here's the point. We've had a tragedy, a system that begins well and ends in destruction. Then we begin a new cycle in the spring. And I asked my undergraduate students, I said, what's the system's issue in this? What's the design problem? And finally, one particularly bright student sat up in his chair and he said, it's a self-renewing system. Well, holy smoke, a self-renewing system. I thought it was a keen insight to see this. But to, what does it mean to Shakespeare? What it means to Shakespeare is, is this. Nature is the first principle. And it's not nature as physical matter, the way we tend to think of nature. Nature is a creative force. It's a strength, a power. And we, being created within nature, share in that power through our arts. <laughs> But we make mistakes and bad decisions. But nature itself, with these cycles, gradually brings us back if we can survive the 16 years of despair. And that's what the passage means to me, <clears throat> that there is an art that mends the, <coughs> no, not men, that changes nature that lets us produce hybrid crops, variegated flowers, all of the variations that we make in products and services. But this art has its grounding in nature. Our problems come when we spit in the wind, when we go against what wisdom and nature would, would say. So I'm back now to design. Design as a healing art, an art of care. For many designers, the concept of care has become a central theme, a purpose, a principle. Fascinated by that, by the significance of that. But if we can teach management as an art of care, how do we do that? What are the concepts and methods that we use here at the Weatherhead to teach management about the design process? Well, I can tell you some of the initial things. First of all, you have to find the right qualities of people. Um, and they can be cultivated sometimes, sometimes not. We were looking at the first year MBA students, and they were, one of the students raised and said, what kind of student do you want in this class? And I said, well, somebody who asks questions would be a nice thing. I'd like that. That was an easy one. But I said, no, they've got to be, it's got to be someone who likes to see the whole, who likes to see the whole when I was in, in, in high school or junior high school, I, they took a few of us, five or six of us, from different schools in the region to visit uh, Martin Marietta, the makers of the Atlas missile and other missiles. And I remember my, my, the other people I was with, they were all science types, and they wanted to see all of the, the technical stuff. And I, I walked into the, the room, room hardly describes it, like a stadium, this huge missile sitting there. 
And I look around and I'm wondering, what is everybody doing with this, with this thing? Who does what to whom? And how do you, how do you order? Already I knew <laughs> that management had some part of my life to play. But to see the whole, do you enjoy seeing the whole? Some people begin with parts and work up to the whole. But there are other people that start with the whole and then work out the detail. I think it's important if you embrace the design uh, notion. It's useful if you begin with the whole. There are some designers that don't, but by and large, that's one of the traits. Another trait is an enthusiasm for making things, just to see an idea brought to fruition. It's almost the definition of an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, depending on how you like to see that. A real pleasure, a delight, an emotional satisfaction in bringing something forward. Not just having a sheet of paper with numbers, but actually using those numbers to make something. Another trait, and this one is going to be strange to you, I think, perhaps. It's, it, I don't know how to say it. It's polysensorial delight. Polysensorial delight. Oh, jeez. God, I'm so sorry. I can't think of any other phrase. It's an enjoyment in all the senses. That you like to look at things and see things, that you appreciate the visual. We live in a world dominated by language, by language and numbers. But not everyone learns by language and numbers. Sometimes we learn by the diagrams and by the visions, the imagination we have. In fact, the concept of imagination is the ability to visualize in our mind that capability. Sometimes it has to do with sound, could be taste, smell, but all of the senses, you're alive to the senses. That's an important feature for being in. And there is one last trait. And when I was uh, dean of uh, design at Carnegie Mellon, I, I always asked students when they came in, the parents would bring them by, and I, I would try to discourage them from coming in. They should find some cheaper school someplace or something. But, but I, so I, my strategy is to discourage people, and then if they, if they get through that, then I, I, I want them. And, and I would say, uh, <coughs> um, I would say to them, why, why do you want to be a designer? Show me the things that you've sketched, little doodles and things. And if I, I one of the tip-offs in all design schools, every design teacher knows that if you see a skull with a dagger plunged through one eye, this is not a student for design. <laughs> this is not good, this is not good. <laughs> and you, you'd be amazed at how many high school kids draw that kind of garbage. But I, I look for students, maybe with intellectual curiosity, that's, that's good, but I look particularly for care. Do they care about other people? Are they curious about other people? They don't have to be extroverts. You know, the Myers-Briggs scaling of introvert and extrovert and so forth. I, I, I don't care about that, that distinction, at, not at this point. I want to know if down deep they, they have a concern or a regard for other people. That's a tip-off to me, that there's a designer in the making, because design is a service in itself. The best designers are the designers who care about other people. They make with other people in mind. These are the beginnings. So we look for those traits in our students and try to cultivate those traits, and not everyone has them, clearly. Beyond that, we look for areas of str Yes, David. Uh, two questions. Two, okay. and a good manager. So is there, are there characteristics of those who might be good for design that differentiate them from other goodness? I mean, caring is probably not bad no matter what you do. Do you read your Aristotle? On occasion. Occasion. Aristotle argues that, that character is something that is formed, it doesn't, it's not personality, it's not temperament, it's formed in practice. So I would say that whatever the inclination that a student has for this or that, they pick up the habits of that. And in some cases they go into science, in some cases they become physicians, 
And Herb, Herb Simon said, you know, design is in all the professions. And he makes a point of this. In fact, it's part of a, a famous definition that's too, too often quoted. So I think that uh, there's, there's nothing strange in this. The question is how do you cultivate the habits that lead to the character of a designer? And then in turn, that make them able to embrace other professional practices. I have a doctoral student right now at Carnegie. I still got five doctoral students down there. They're almost finished. That's gonna be a great moment very soon, but uh, they're very close to going out in the world. But one of them is uh, indeed working with, uh, with, with the Mayo Clinic, very much concerned with medicine and medical design, service design in that area. Uh, he's going to be a really good one. Um, he won't be a doctor. He grew up as a craftsman. Uh, there's a famous church in Pittsburgh that has this immense organ. And on Sunday, it just fills Shadyside with its glory. Well, he made that organ. He was part of the team that made it in New Zealand, by the way. But that's my answer to you. Yes, those are traits that occur in any good profession. You might look for those. There are a couple of others I haven't mentioned here. But I think it's more in the cultivation of those habits because not everyone has those. And not everyone can be a manager. So let's go to the first one. Uh, which is the, the first characteristic, which is be the whole. Yes. Now, you know, many people would argue that one of the problems with medicine is the proliferation of specialists. Yep. It's exactly the question to be asked. It's exactly the question that I'm asking. Remember, I tried to problematize the concept of system at the very beginning. I suggested that system <coughs> may be old wine in new bottles, and there are all kinds of holes around us. The disciplines create different kinds of holes. And, and in fact, uh, I can justify reading the Winter's Tale as a system because it's an aesthetic system. It's a system in a work of art. And that's recognized even, even among systems theorists. And so many kinds of holes, but that sense of whatever hole gets to you, that's significant. I talked to the architect last night, <coughs> Ville Aretz is his name, uh, and he told me that early in his career he, he had made one small building, but he was invited in with about 12 other architects to compete for another special building. And he came in and his pitch, he said he didn't show any images, maybe one little tiny sketch, but most of the time he spent talking about the program of the organization. How is the place organized? What kind of company is it? What do you do? How do you divide up the duties and tasks? Uh, and he got the job. All the other architects came in and talked about the details of how they made things, how they could handle building systems and so forth, but he had the sense of the wholeness, the essence as he put it, of the organization. That's a kind of wholeness and it fits his kind of designing, his kind of architecture. Yeah. So um, <coughs> I'm finding the discussion very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And when you talk about the whole, this building was designed by an architect who was thinking of the whole in one way. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill McDonough, you might know who he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if he were to look at this building and, and evaluate it, he might say, well, actually, yes, it was designed with people in mind, but it actually wasn't designed with natural systems. It wasn't designed with a number of other criteria. Exactly so, and we're back to what constitutes a whole. And uh, part of what I'm arguing is there's not a single simple solution. <clears throat> we live in a pluralistic culture. Human nature itself yields to the pluralism. It is an essentially contested issue of what constitutes wholeness, that in fact we thrive on those different visions of wholeness. The case with the Winter's Tale, we have a king who had his vision of wholeness, but it wasn't a sustainable vision. It brought destruction to, the, to, his, to his system, to his kingdom, to his family, to the order of society that he was rolling through. It's a wrong notion. But there are other competing notions that may be good and may be needed in the long run. In fact, we would argue, using David Orr, that loose coupling is a critically significant component of systems thinking. That if the units are too tightly connected, they won't have the flexibility to take on new circumstances. And that flexibility for us is ideas. I guess I would argue, though, that, that it isn't totally up to choice anymore, and that the other um, path that we're looking at it takes, which is sustainable systems or sustainability, if that 
that's not taken into account as the natural system that you're in and the social system that you have to take into account here, which has been how I was trained as a chemical engineer. We didn't actually uh, work your chemical engineer. Uh, and I designed things, but we didn't actually worry about what was that harmful or how much energy it used because our design criteria was wrong. So didn't embrace a wide enough sphere of consequences. Exactly. So we didn't yes. do the green chemistry that, that Carnegie Mellon is now doing a lot of. So, yep. Um, exactly. So I would say that, that designers, uh, that there's actually some natural laws that we inform what that hole is, that because we know things today we didn't know, our parents and grandparents didn't know. This is a really interesting point. You remember when I talked about Shakespeare, I said that the use of nature there was a little different than we used to think, than we typically think of nature. We're right now at one of those moments of pluralism because for Shakespeare, nature is a power and laws do not adequately characterize what, what nature is. It's a different vision of nature. Nature is a creative force in a sense. I think the notion of nature you're giving us is one that is uh, a matter with the laws that govern the, the movement of particles and combinations. <coughs> it's, an, it's an intelligent, reasonable alternative philosophically uh, and in fact, it's part of the pluralism of how we do, do a science. But you're a chemical engineer. I, I, I tell all my friends that chemical engineering is one of the key design disciplines. It is. I think it is. I felt that way for, for, for many, many, many years. Because in fact, you have to design the processes and flow, the distillations that come, say, from the handling of petroleum, the, uh, the heating processes, the, uh, and so forth. And we know also the first time I ever saw economics, it was that it's poorly designed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I like this very much. I'm going to come back on this in a minute. I saw a hand. Yes. Uh, the answer you gave to the first basic uh, came from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. That's right. The book four. But you, you skipped a step. Um, you went straight to the practice of phoneme society. I did. But the first two speak to episteme, which is the concept making first. Well, if you notice, though, I did distinguish the practical level at the master's. And then the role of the doctor is where I'm going to right. introduce this. But the part I want to get to is the second one, the technic part, which is the same word from which we get present, the, the model making. That's exactly it, yes. Creation, what you call the self-renewal part. Exactly so, so. exactly so. If we do so. that, then we don't have to limit ourselves to one or two, but to a multiplicity. I think that's a very good way of putting it. In fact, that's what we have to learn to deal with, that there's not a single approach that's adequate. And I want to pick up on this, though, and go back to David's question about wholeness. And I want to say that what I see as the wholeness of a product may be uh, an answer here partly, too. Uh, I see many products created. Uh, I don't actually think they're products. They're partial products. To me, to be a product, you have to combine technological reasoning. You have to combine that with affordances to the human hand and mind pathos of products. And it also has to be combined with, well, there's no easy way to put this, it has to be combined with ethos, a quality of character. Uh, we call that brand, by the way, but it has other meanings. That every product is successful if it does its job, if it does it in a way that I can use it in my life, like a chair made of concrete, <coughs> I can't do much with that in my house. Not, not good. But the third quality is the, is the most bizarre. It has to be desirable. And by desirable, I don't mean that we have to lust after it necessarily. I mean we have to feel that we would bring it into our homes, that it's part of who we are, that we can, uh, we find an identification with it. Now understand what I'm saying here, that the wholeness of design that we seek in management and in other branches of design is this combination of the technical st structure. Think of this in, the, in a management context. You've got to be able to get a group to do the job that has to be done. The task must be completed. You have to do it in a way that takes advantage of the capabilities of the people who are participating. You put the wrong person in the wrong role, it's not going to work. But even if you do those two things, it still will not necessarily be successful for you, not sustainable in the long run. If we can't also identify with it, and then the words we use for that in business are buy-in, 
uh, not just compliance, but uh, <coughs> acceptance. These three things make a good product. These are concepts that are drawn from design and play right into what we do in management. In fact, if you go to, if you look at the school the way it's structured now, and I, I like this school a lot. I have criticisms, but I like it a lot. I have criticisms of everything, it seems. What are they gonna do? But if you look at the school, you'll find an excellent OB group interested in organizational behavior, the relations of people. Very powerful in this sense. You'll find another group that's excellent in the analytic side of what I would call the technology of business. They understand the flow of money. Uh, you were talking about economic theories. Uh, economics sits on top of, that, that, of the tasks of accounting and, and so forth. Um, but to be honest, I've not found, well how can I say this? Several years ago, people here at Weatherhead spoke of management as a noble art, a noble profession. I don't find a lot of talk about that right now, except in this notion that design, well, back to the wholeness, that if we put these parts together, that's the art, that's the whole that we're seeking. Not just the products that we create, but the discipline of thinking that we create, that that becomes the techne, or the art. I figured you knew what I was talking about, jeez. <laughs> Yep. Because many times as we go through organizations or come into organizations, we're, pre we're presented with issues of what to preserve of what you've inherited in the existing organization. Yeah. And then what and how do you add to it? Now, let me use an analogy. It's like taking uh, a home that's 30 years old and you decide, okay, I want to put an addition on it, but I want to make the addition fit so well you Right. And that's kind of what we're trying to do in the integration of either new products, services, or new companies or new organizations. Into Very much the so. It's the adaptation. We have to, we have to make the decision <coughs> of what to preserve in the existing foundation and then what and how to add to that foundation if you're going to have any sustainability for going on to the future. Exactly. What we often find what we're lacking is the tool of how to make it work. That's right. And that's where I go to the practices of design. And I want to come at this very directly on this. Um, I worked on a project some time ago with the redesign of Banff, the great natural park in Canada, the greatest park in, in, in North America. <laughs> I had a minor role in this, but the person who was driving it came to me, his name is Eric Higgs, he came to me and he said, uh, Dick, I want to use your ideas about design, bring it into the battle between the conservationists and the developmentalists because we need to reshape Banff, but we need to reshape it in compliance with the interests of all the parties. This is what I call a wicked problem, a problem where values are essentially contested. By essentially contested, I mean there is no calculated solution. They are fundamentally opposed values. Now in this situation, uh, clearly the developmentalists thought of the designer and the design approach as being a touchy-feely kind of thing. Geez, it's not practical, you're gonna, not gonna make money out of it, things like that. The conservationists thought of design as Disneyland. Oh, they wanna make it into a Disney park. The truth is that design works by focusing on projects. And I suppose this would be my claim about the nature of systems, and I'll state the general proposition, then I'll explain the particular. The general proposition is by definition, it is impossible for a human being to experience a system by definition. And that this is the source of so many of our problems. Now what I mean by this, is not that there aren't systems, but we can't experience them. A system by its nature is all that has happened, is happening, and will happen within the framework. And only God experiences that. We experience our pathway through the system. We might speculate on the solar system and what it's going to be in a million years. If uh, Pluto will come back into the orbit of planets, if Jupiter will migrate toward the sun, who knows? We might speculate. But the truth is, all we know, in my case, 63 orbits of the sun. That's all I know about. 
and I pay attention to the stars. I was going to be an astronomer or an astrophysicist. Thought I was going to be for sure, but didn't. All we know are our own pathways through the systems. And so we begin now to make it practical and particular. We deal with projects. We're going to talk about how to redesign Banff? I don't think so. Nobody is going to agree on how to redesign Banff. Instead, you pick a particular project within Banff. Take on a project that you might be able to, to come to grips with, like moving a path from this where in the, in the forest to here. Move it 100 yards, 500 yards. And you say, well, what's that got to do with a system in Banff? Well, the truth is that pathway of human uh, transit has built up over a period of time. And if you look just at the project, developmentalists and conservationists, they don't have a lot of skin in the game in that kind of a decision. You know, they can check their ideology at the door because it's a practical problem of where to move that path. The language of the project begins to bring the people together and they can come to an agreement as they have in, in Banff in many cases. Not all the projects have worked that way, but many have. Design focuses on projects. And so you find teams from different parts of a company and we want to see that, that inclusion of people, alternative voices. We call it participatory design or co-design. In some cases, we bring the client or the customer into that design process. There are various ways of doing it. But this is one way to think about that transition between what was and what will be, and actually spending a fair amount of time in surfacing the different visions and ideas that drive a group. One thing we know in design is when you're given a brief by a company, and you sit down at the table and say, here's the brief. Do you all understand it? Every head goes, yep, I understand it, got it. You know, we've done some research in this. And when you start asking them, well, what, just what do you understand? Turns out they understand six different briefs if there are six people, maybe seven briefs if there are six people. They each have a different understanding. So part of the design process is a dialogue, a conversation about what do you mean by this? Or what do you think we should do in this? Taking the time to explore the brief, to surface ideas that may be in opposition, or that may just be enrichments. And gradually through conversation, finding that <coughs> shared ground for, for action. Now, we know this in management. This is not foreign. But you know, it's part of a design process of making something. Now there are other, other methods and techniques. I won't go through everything here, but but I want you to know that there are ways of working in this that we think are very significant. Uh, this is one example. We also believe it's, for instance, that prototyping is a really big deal in organizational activities. You prototype an activity. Prototyping means it doesn't have to be perfect the first time. Uh, I was doing a project with the uh, tax office in Australia, and some of you know the story on this. <laughs> They, they, were, they were so emotionally entrapped, they had to get it right the first time. They felt that if they showed any weakness, they would be killed. Uh, fired, wiped out, dismissed. There was a compulsion to get it right the first time. And I promise you, when you have that compulsion, you will not get it right the first time. So instead, we build in a process of prototyping and revision. We prototype, evaluate. Prototype, evaluate, prototype, evaluate before the launch. Now, there are software companies that believe in launch, prototype, evaluate. <laughs> and I get tired, so I, you know, I, I, I really like this iPad. I, I have a feeling it's going to be a very serious product. But I'm not going to buy the first generation. I'm going to buy the second. <laughs> I learned a long time ago, and you're going with technology, it's sometimes wise to wait for that, uh, that first wave. <laughs> <laughs> I waited long enough I didn't need it. <laughs> uh, the idea of prototyping is important, evaluating. And you evaluate with user testing. We believe that very much in design, that you bring this out to, to work with a small group to see how they react to it. And not just focus groups. I'll tell you, I've got a real worry about focus groups. They have some function within marketing a limited role, but they are asked to carry too much burden. They do not carry the full weight that they're asked to carry. So instead of that, we will have a variety of other observational techniques. 
including shadowing, role playing, and scenario building, and I, I would go on and on about these. There are many, many techniques. But they're ways of getting to know how people react to products and services. Uh, the Australian government launched a VAT, a value added tax, uh, not using a design process, and the government almost fell. And they went back and did an audit. They asked the design groups to audit this, and they pointed out repeatedly how a early prototyping would have surfaced some of the major obstacles to that tax. It just would have revealed so clearly things not to do. So prototyping is becoming a, a part of the new tax office policy there. This is another way. We believe that visualization is an important part of design. In fact, I have a strong belief that we should begin to teach serious visualization within the first year MBA program, teaching people how to present graphs and structured materials, how to diagram, how to sketch even. I don't have a problem showing them how to sketch. Um, <laughs> I never use slides or PowerPoint. Um, occasionally I'll do a diagram and sketch something, but I learned a long time ago that uh, you're either gonna listen to me or, or not. And, uh, so I think that should be a part of, of management education. I've had enough experience with this myself, and we've seen it in studies as well, that a, a sketch, a diagram, a concept map can have remarkable persuasive power can help you to see new things. When a product is in place, the delivery of that product is a significant step in design. How do you deliver it? When we design artifacts, we deliver very carefully to the company. But when you're inside a company, how does management deliver a concept? Well, you know this very well. This is the problem of, of instituting the implementation <laughs> phase, really, in many ways. That's a design problem in its own right. How do you design the implementation? Um, we did a huge project with the Postal Service, did our work wonderfully well, but I trusted the VP at the Postal Service because she was really bright, and she was doing all the things in the background. I was watching what she was sending, the messages she was sending around the organization. It's a huge organization, $70 billion, and oh, more airplanes than, oh, geez, it's amazing. But she knew that the implementation had to be her baby. So we did the design work on, the, on our part of it, and she was laying the ground designing the implementation. Um, those are some of the methods and concepts that are central in design. We're teaching those now to MBA students. We're experimenting with some. We're getting better. We're in the second year of, the, uh, of this effort, my second year here, and I'm teaching the course with the MBA students with Fred Kotlopi. Uh, and they, uh, Fred and Dick and others here at the Weatherhead, have gotten their ideas about design, managing as designing, from the Gary effort here in the building. They, they saw how he worked, his ability to use sketching to bring ideas forward, and Fred and Dick and the others are pretty, pretty bright folk, and they realized there was something different going on there. I have to be honest, they weren't sure quite how to make it happen, quite what to do, but we're now engaged in that process of unpacking this, which again is the reason for the June conference, because uh, you, you call a conference to see who comes. And we have our ammunition ready. We, we know our position now. We know the argument that we're gonna make. So we're interested in whether, what other uh, leaders will come, and it's turned out to be quite, there'll be two university presidents and uh, some other very serious folks. So we think we're onto something serious. We found in our experiments with the class now, the way forward, I think. There is something more I want to talk about, though, and I've got only another hour to go. Geez, what else could there be? <laughs> this is the big one, though, and it's one that I would like to hear things from you about. It has to do with why we design. It has to do with values and ethics. I uh, make it a practice that every course I teach ends with a section on ethics. Um, and I, uh, I'm concerned that people might misunderstand what ethics might mean. Um, there is a notion from ethics as treated in the past that ethics concerns making judgments about actions already performed. <coughs> Judgmental, guilty, not guilty, good, bad. 
there is another notion of ethics that has uh, emerged. Carolyn Whitbeck, who was a faculty member here at Case, has written a wonderful book in engineering, ethics in engineering practice and research. And her argument is that design itself is a form of ethics. And listen to this argument. Instead of thinking of ethics as judgment after the fact, why not think of it as solving problems before the fact? That in fact we discuss our problems in a designerly way to understand the ethical issues we will encounter. She cites many examples from engineering design, some of them well known, some of them not. Um, but I think that her notion plays very heavily. I've written this in, I did an encyclopedia article, in fact, on design ethics, and I cited her strongly at one point. But the issues of ethics essentially deal with wicked problems, competing values, the ability to understand and articulate the values of our opponents, of others. It's a part of the skill we have to have as managers, I think. Uh, to be honest, uh, my studies in, at university began with rhetoric. And over the years, I realized that dialectic is the driving intellectual art in business schools. That may surprise you, but I think that is exactly the case. Uh, group process. I don't know how you feel about that, Paul. Am I, am, am, I, am I full of it? <laughs> Not from my perspective. Hey, Paul. <laughs> now, dialectic. Think about dialectic here for a second. I, I, you know, in the United States and in Britain, we don't use the word dialectic. And if we do, it's usually with a spit. Or it's, a, it's qualified by dialectical materialism or some Marxist notion or whatever. There are some very good Marxist <laughs> theorists, but... <coughs> um, in fact, there's a Marxist theorist that uh, bears very heavily on what, what you're interested in. He speaks of the, uh, the recessive, the dominant, and the emergent aspects of culture. And that all three are always present in an organization. Culture is his focus. But the gradual transformation of those, it's a very powerful tool for understanding how we grow organizations. But I digress. Let me go back. We don't use dialectic very much in the United States or Europe, although we have at times. The uh, transcendentalists of New England, uh, Emerson, they were great dialecticians. Dialectic used to really annoy me because I thought it was logic chopping, but I began to understand that I, that I had not understood. Um, there's a phrase from Carl Jaspers. He says, the truth begins with two. That simple sentence, the truth begins with two. Think about our political situation today. Both sides are certain, certain beyond reason. There's no middle, no hypothetical middle, no, no third term to the dialectic. We see a frozen dialectic in our society right now. But there is a three-term dialectic that we use where you have a view of things and I have a view, but I'm not sure I've got it right and I probably think you don't have it right either. But when we talk about it, we discover things along the way and we form ideas between us that may be useful to follow like our work at Banff, that, that, that project. The ability to form this through conversation together. Let me try another run at this. It takes a couple of runs, because this is not an easy one. We're talking about systems here. We're talking about the design of complex systems. The heart of every system is an idea. Let us not mince words about this. An idea lies at the core of every system. We may express it as a field equation. We may express it as a statement of principle or value. We may use a flag, some way to symbolize it. But at every, in every system, there is an idea at its core. The discovery of that idea is the challenge of design. I've got a colleague in Sydney who, uh, who's his own personal practice. He's a probably the best facilitator I've ever seen. Just, just brilliant. I've never seen anything quite like it. He's a good friend. I brought him to Carnegie Mellon, as a matter of fact, as a visiting professor. He hires my students, and he does great work there. And he'll be, in fact, he'll be at the June conference. 
Uh, Tony has a way of facilitating what he calls strategic conversations, usually with board members, upper level directors, high government officers around some issue. He can facilitate the discussion and use visualization to capture ideas and relationships. And he takes all the time needed for the group to come to some resolution of some set of things that they might agree on or to expose clearly the points of difference. I say it in just a few words. That's at the heart of every organization, trying to find those things that we share. But that's what dialectic is about. Dialectic is the art of making things systematic, of systematizing, of finding the idea that holds a whole together. I, uh, so my ideas of dialectic as logic chopping and things, I, I was stupid, I, I was uneducated. <laughs> yes? Uh, I hope you don't take this the wrong way. Oh, why not? The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with, this, with all of the good things that you're, you're trying to do in baking in these ideas into design and to teach your manager to teach you a way to think. The art of management. Yep. Like day, day in, day out. When, when you think coming up, when you think about the design, when you try to put there's no such thinking on top of an education system that starts with a, with a certain framework, and they're coming along, and you just don't see the, the population of folks <coughs> that are able to keep up with where you're going. They must be confined to a finite group that can that, that buy into this. So they're going to be managing a whole group of people, thousands, millions of people that aren't anywhere near Right. So when you when you try to match up how people perceive other people's value, it comes into what can you do for me today? What specialization do you have? What kind of functional things do you need me to get to next week, next month, or whatever? So it's like a management education that's coming from I think a great dimension, but it's 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 bombarding up with the other millions of people that aren't even anywhere near it. Oh, that's very much where where Herb Herb started his argument about engineering. You remember in 1960, you don't remember 1960. I remember 1960. You're not that old. Oh, <laughs> you look quite young. <coughs> in 1960, <coughs> virtually all engineers had master's degrees, master of science. Within 10 years, almost all had doctorates. My point here is not to turn managers into doctorates. That's not what we're about. But to say that the changes do take place and in fact, that's, that's the, the course that we're on now. How do we make that change? We have an executive MBA program where we're also introducing ideas of design, but to teach people to be facilitators of design groups. In other words, not to do the design work themselves, but to help the people who report to them implement design process. We're interested in that aspect of it. I mentioned the consultant in uh, Sydney uh, uh, and, and his success. He himself practices at this high level of strategic conversation. His firm is about how to bring that down practically into the organization with other kinds of tools and practices that are feasible and reasonable within the limits of people. I have to say that accounting to me is one of the most interesting of the disciplines at the Weatherhead or in, in the business community. And I'm saying that not to, not to uh, uh, kiss up to you, but uh, instead to say what I have come to understand is that accounting is essentially about how we represent systems. And the, the, the capacity for representation <coughs> using quantitative measures in part, but also understanding how to use the numbers in a management process, that's an exciting creative activity. And I don't mean the joke about creative accounting. I mean it's a serious thing. And I think uh, I found even in accounting students here a great interest in information presentation and display. They're kind of surprised that that can happen. Uh, I don't expect every student to be able to do this. But I think that if we all live in organizations, we're going to have to cope with these kinds of issues. Uh, and that's, that's why we're pushing ahead here, that we think that's going to have to make. I won't say, let me put it this way, I think it has to happen. I think our organizations are in such bad shape today, everywhere, not just in the United States, I'm not an America basher, but everywhere, organizations are in big trouble. They need another way to work. And I mean government as well as uh, uh, for, for profit. How do we change this? 
Uh, when I taught a course in, uh, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, when I taught a course in management at uh, Carnegie Mellon, I began teaching design students about management. That's one bridge. Uh, in my syllabus, I had a quote from, from, from Kafka. It's the beginning of his novel, The Castle. And you may not remember this, but the central character is called K. In the opening paragraph, K is coming toward a village, and it's snowing like crazy. And he's about to cross the bridge that goes into the, the village. And he just gets halfway across the, the bridge and looks up. It's snowing so hard you can't see anything. But he knows that the castle is there. He knows that its dominant influence is there. And I think that's what we feel in organizations, is a dominant presence of organizations. That's why I think in partnership with this notion of design, we also need a theory of the organization. And so some of my colleagues are beginning to chew on that problem as well. You remember at Carnegie Mellon, they had the theory of the firm. We think we need to have a theory of organization to go with this, that that's part of our agenda. It's kind of a long response, but I liked your question a lot. You had a question, I'm sorry. A little bit of jump uh, onto uh, Richard's uh, material there. Uh, mm -hmm. You haven't talked at all uh, about the uh, process genesis of your management style. Uh, I work with a lot of fiduciaries. Yep. Uh, managers, uh, directors, board members, and such. Um, and I'm just listening to what you're talking about. I'm just trying to. Uh, oh, how could it possibly be done? Yep. And That's the ultimate I, test. I haven't seen, I, I'm not familiar with the literature, but has, those, has that been done to validate? We are in the process of that right now, and that's why I'm speaking to you here. It's a problem for doctoral research to find out how we go about validating. There is work in this, and it's showing interesting results. Certainly the number of books that deal with this subject is growing, and the number of studies associated with it is growing. But I'm, I will make no glib claims about this. This is inquiry. <clears throat> we are at the beginning of something, not at the end of it. And so that's exactly what we need to find out. Where does it work? Under what conditions? How and why? Uh, those are things that we want to investigate. Keep going, yeah. Yep. Um, in, in each person's <laughs> example, who ultimately makes that decision and who ultimately is responsible for that decision? Now, we were close to this in your question as well, and I kind of, I kind of moved a little bit to the side. I moved instead to talk about dialectic. Right, right. And I want to bring up here the theory of organizational learning uh, to understand different models of leadership. If you remember from Senge's book, have you all read Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline? If you remember, Senge argues that the, the leader uh, can no longer have a, a simple power and control model, top-down power and control, that in fact the leader ends up becoming a facilitator of the work of others. Facilitator is an interesting word. And then Senge begins to talk about the leader as a designer. And I'm puzzling this over, and I'm thinking about dialectic as this this frozen dialectic, two-term dialectic of power and control and revolution and all that, you know, all that Marxist stuff. And I realized, whoa, wait a minute. Not all leaders have to be dictators. That in fact, a dialectician uh, may in fact not be a power figure, but may be in fact a facilitator. The projects that I've mentioned have all had champions at upper levels. One reason that we're talking to the MBA uh, executive ed program in this respect. It takes a champion, but how can the champion face this paradox? And paradoxes are always central to dialectic. A paradox of being a leader who is not a leader. You've probably met leaders who are leaders. And I suspect in your area of work they've been bosses. bosses. Yeah. Yeah. And so part of this argument is that to be an effective leader, you have to take a different approach. And to be real honest about that, with the economic times as they are, and the changing base of business activity, 
You just can't work that, that way anymore. You just can't. We have an organization, I'll get to you in a second. We have an organization here in uh, Cleveland. Uh, it's a great uh, orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra. Wonderful orchestra. Formed in the model of management when industry was king in Cleveland. They still run as if they are an industrial organization. Power and control, high vertical and down, and everybody has to toe the line. We had some students doing work with them, and if the student dared to interview somebody that hadn't been approved by management, we got a letter, a letter telling us they should not interview this person. That's a kind of model that frankly just cannot persist. You've heard about the union troubles that they've had at the, at the orchestra now, that battle. Uh, there are other battles coming and the declining attendance. We maybe want to wipe that off this tape. Um, <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> yes? Um, kind of building on the last two, last two questions. And then get back to you for yours. Part of, part of um, I think part of what you're talking about here is encompassing a need, right? Encompassing a need. You build a system, you build a product, you build an organization, you build a business for it. You need a need. A need or a want or a desire? Yes. An iPad is a little more amorphous in terms of ability. Uh, 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 that, um, whether there might really be a demand for that kind of product. Yes. And, and Apple has failed as often as they've succeeded. Yes. I think it's a reasonable answer. And sure. Not. You betcha. Um, how do you know, how can Leatherhead know that uh, the market Well, I don't know about that. So, so Organizational learning is flourishing. What, 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 how do you know that, 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 that the um, leadership world is ready for some kind of Do you have to talk to those folks? Yeah. How, how, how do you know what, 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 what's the group? Uh, it was interesting at the um, Global Forum. Do you remember the Global Forum that was held here? Um, organized by David uh, Copperwriter. Um, Number of CEOs were at that at the conference. We talked with them separately, had fairly extensive discussions. Mohan was quite interested in what their their views were. They were very positive about this. It's a small sample. We talk with other companies about this approach. The sponsors I've talked about have certainly demonstrated their interest in it. We found it in other cases too. The literature that's attracting uh, corporate interest beyond Northeast Ohio certainly is there. It's it's certainly there. We have no, no doubt about that. Yeah, this. We can go right back to the very beginning of the conversation, the, the dilemma that we do have. I don't much like uh, hysteria when it comes to setting matters. I, I don't like to talk about revolutions or about crises. I find that to be boring. <coughs> but we are going through a very difficult time for organizations, and I don't mean just in the last couple of years. I mean for some time there has been a, a flagging of innovation in companies, a failure to respond well to, to customers. Uh, I collect newspaper stories uh, about this kind of matter. There was recently, there, there's a water department in Cleveland. Um, and I, some of you from this area, you know about this. They've been sending out bills that are, I don't know, they're from La La Land. I, I don't know. And, and they've, they've promised that they're going to improve their service. They're only off by five orders of magnitude. Five orders of magnitude. Five orders of magnitude. Yeah, but yeah, it's an estimate. Yeah. They estimate, yeah, we estimate. So we're gonna, and uh, another company decides that they're gonna buy uh, energy saving light bulbs for us and they're gonna charge us about uh, what, 30, 40% more than the cost of the bulbs and they've, they've decided they're gonna do this. They're gonna send them out in the mail until there's suddenly a revolution in the, uh, in the community saying, hell no. Now I, I raise this because 
I, I like Northeast Ohio. I think it's a really nice area. I, I have roots that go back into this area, actually, I, I do. Um, but I find people here remarkably tolerant of really bad service. <laughs> I don't know what the hell's wrong. I mean, you can go and step on people's feet and they'll say, oh, excuse me, and get out of your way. I don't understand this. Uh, this is puzzling to me. It's a sign to me of, of a lethargy of organization, uh, organizational habits, and it, it infects government. I believe that very deeply. Uh, it infects business. And I guess that's, that's the kind of data I begin to assemble for a recognition. That, and that's why it's not just here that we're doing this. We're doing it lots of other places. So our conference, again, is a, is a, is a, is a weather bell of this and with people from all over the world coming. Um, that's a sign. I just got back from Mexico. My wife and I were down there giving workshops to, uh, to people in their business and design schools. First time they'd ever talked together. And uh, Mexico realizes that it needs to cultivate a, a new entrepreneurship. They have excellent design schools. So this is I, I TESM, which is like the MIT of, of the technical institute. But they've never, they've never talked together before. So using design as a way of bridging that gap, uh, they participated in our workshop. And uh, we've gotten word back that those, those students are clamoring for continued work in that area. And they're meeting on their own to, to discuss product ideas and things. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about, I guess. It's a long, long way. I think that's a good kind of question to ask, but there's lots of answer back on it. You had something. Let me go back over here. You had your hand up. I don't want to. I wanted to go back to the comment about the role of the leader and, and yes. what it's done. Yes, it's very significant. And, and, I, and I do believe there is someone who makes the decision. I, I, oh, yeah. And, and no one's going to sway me from that part. No, no. But, and I know of course. Senge's, I, I know his argument of the facilitation, and I, and, I, and I realize the facilitation role works very well in a group as long as the model holds the model that they use to make decisions holds. And I've seen this occur multiple times. But then somebody throws a monkey wrench in and it's something every manager hopes that their people will get. And the monkey wrench is intuition, which has become <coughs> one of the burgeoning areas of, of management research and it's worth it. And, and if you think of what intuition is, it's the intersection, what is it? It's the intersection of knowledge, experience, and the stomach. Yes. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. And, and once, intu once intuition comes in, when that one person says, I see what you're all telling me, I see what the model says, but it's wrong. And they cannot explain it, they can't show you the number, they can't show you anything. At that moment, the facilitation process will, I'm not gonna say break down, but the facilitation it's challenged. process will be Preempted. It's a challenge. Uh, I, I want to quibble with you on something, though. You say intuition. I would say informed intuition. Oh, uh, oh I want to be real cautious about that. Yeah, no, that, that was there, but I just want to be sure we use the word uh, informed, because this is a serious word in design itself. Uh, when we look at design, there are two phases of the design process. One is an analysis based on research. We do extensive research in design work, many kinds of research. But research won't tell us the answer. It takes an ability to wield those things together, and that takes what's called in our field informed intuition. And so it's a, it's a mysterious quality in some ways, but maybe not unteachable. Uh, but not everyone can have that. So there's no, there's no question about this to me. But when you find a member of a team who just simply says, no, that's not right, and I'm not gonna go along with it, I take that as an honest expression. And there are ways to deal with that, I think. And it has to be challenged. It has to be challenged, and, and in fact, that kind of conversation I mentioned earlier, going through the brief, uh, our research shows that the time spent in coming, overcoming those differences of views in the early analysis of a brief more than pays off down the road. Because premature closure on what the issues are in the brief, if, you're, if it is premature closure, down the road, it'll blow up, and you'll have to go back and restart the whole thing again. So the time we spend in articulating these differences, and there is a point at which differences are just differences. And I, uh, and if this is part of the ethics, I uh, talk to designers and I say, know when to not take a client, or when to walk away. There does come a moment when you have to make that decision. But it's an honest one, and straight ahead. And that's why, I, as I said, when I recruit students for the design programs, I uh, try to 
urge them to go elsewhere. And if they, if they really want to come, uh, make sure that they, they feel comfortable in doing this. So that's a kind of a leadership challenge too, to make sure you've got the people who, the, but the differences of opinion are valuable. That's part of, that's part of what Wicked Problems is about, how to embrace those differences. That's a great intellectual challenge and not everyone on a team can do that. But, uh, but, but that's what has to be done. I, I have a couple of hands and I, which way do you want to go? Okay, <laughs> he, says, he nominates himself, I'll come back to you. Yep. And they don't have a lot of flexibility in terms of budget. <coughs> and so I'm wondering if this is the, you know, if, if what you're going to find out in these stress periods, uh, your theories are going to be really tested and proved, maybe not even. Not before. just mine, but yes. Yeah. I, I take your point. I, my, my response on this is that uh, these problems existed before the financial crisis. And these ideas have been brewing for a good 10 years, I think, um, because organizations themselves are, are, in, are in great, great stress. The financial problems simply made it more evident, but, but by no means do I see this as a, simply a response to economic bad times. Um, and with regard to the cyclical, though, I want to speak to that particularly. There are two kinds of design work that go on. One is an incremental work in product improvement. And much design work is spent doing just that, finding out, taking a particular practice and saying, well, we have to change it this way or that way. A lot of design work is of that, of that sort. And nothing wrong with that. Uh, occasionally, you need radical innovation. And we are indeed stressing that here more so because uh, we find it actually maybe easier to backfill to the incremental changes. Because in fact, we started out with fairly strong notion with the MBA students, and we've watched them come to projects and realize that they've found their comfort zones. Some of them are very much new thinking. Others are modifications. But all are adequate and sufficient, I, I suppose, is a way of saying that. And I don't mean that in a negative way. They, they are reasonable things that managers could do. So I, I would say that in this, there is not a cyclical notion behind this, really. Although it may be that the opportunity is here now. You had something. Yes. Um, I was going to make an observation mm -hmm. with the, the process that you were laying out that meant, um, many parts of it are similar to the philosophy that the future of inquiry has. And <coughs> uh, executives in other places. And I, I'm going to say the process that David uh, Cooperwriter goes through when he, he works with a, with a group and you can do it at different sizes. Mm -hmm. is the part you'll do at the beginning, which would be paired interviewing, looking for high, mo high point moments in a career. Yep. And uh, I'll give you an example. When the executive team at Walmart was asked with heads of NGO, what they discovered pretty quickly was that they were all leaders of large, complex organizations. And they, they humanized the thing, and they actually realized that many of the things that they thought were value differences Mm -hmm. So they had different information. Sure. And when they got to the point of dialogue, um, some of what we might have thought were value differences actually fell away. And the differences were a lot smaller. So there was a lot more kind of inclusion, which is what I was sort of hearing in the design process. Yes. And I would... Um, that can be useful. I would suggest that some of the... Often in schools, the different disciplines don't work well together. But some of the, the real core nuggets of it interjected into a design process might be quite interesting to see if you can accept 
accelerate some things, facilitate groups in different ways, and actually uh, get to some more trying to do them quicker. Maybe you've already done that. I'm squirming. Have you yeah. noticed that I'm squirming? Yeah. I'm squirming when you bring up appreciative inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of uh, regard for uh, David and the work that he does. And uh, in fact, we've discussed before the relationship of appreciative inquiry and design. And uh, in fact, we participated in appreciative inquiry projects. And uh, at, the, at the forum, I uh, had a good opportunity to do this. Uh, I would say there are aspects of appreciative inquiry that I find very valuable. But they tend to be very early in the process. Um, my own feeling is that they do not have robust design process to carry through. I would agree. And so my sense then is that appreciative inquiry is a way of giving a name to some of the things that a designer would want to do early on, but that the rigor of a design process needs to be understood. Uh, and I'm, I'm fairly serious about a, a rigorous process. I, I, design may seem vague to people, but the process is robust in many ways. Um, can't demonstrate that here, but I, I will say that. Um, I have been frustrated at the appreciative inquiries where I have participated. I have enjoyed the opening burst, and I found great difficulty in carrying forward. So I agree with you, um, and the theory of appreciative inquiry is actually about the inquiry as opposed to the large group process that follows. So they've taken two things, the things that David had in his dissertation and his research and all that, and then they've taken some large group processes that still need to be innovated or whatever. Yeah. But it's that, that first part um, that I'm really referring to. Okay. And he might call that. Then I'm comfortable with this. That, and he might call that actually <laughs> um, finding the sort of positive core that you can build on. Yes. And, and that really is the part that. That's certainly a very reasonable way to do design. Not the only way to do design, yeah. but it's a reasonable way. And I would say that we've had conversations with David regarding the program titles that we're putting together. And um, we felt it was good for the branding of Weatherhead to keep a slight distinction between the two. You understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask about the role of humility. Oh, boy, that's a good one. I like that a lot. I think this might begin to, to uh, uh, answer questions about management. As a, a DM alum who got stuck in the first year methodology, qualitative methodology class, um, what's your talk about? Teach it after that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've now taken it five times. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I look at my courses too. I'm still learning them. This is, the, this is the mantra of design, and I'm pleased to see the way Fred uh, has uh, come to understand this. I, I say, trust the process, right, trust the process. <coughs> and which, which, which it is, works. I'm calling you in. <coughs> oh, I like that, that phrase. Let me give you an example, and this might get to a little bit of the management uh, questions. Um, my classmate, Jim Hill, is working with Jadeep on a project How do you, in a healthcare, in a hypercritical healthcare environment, how do you synchronize the ascensive knowledge and actions of management with the performative routines and knowledge of the frontline staff? Yes. In view of the fact that nurses are on the front line of the healthcare organization are motivated totally differently from yes. the um, from management. Yes. Management's worried about the sustainability of the organization from financial. Do you include the doctor as part of the management? Yes, I would too. Yes, yes. Um, and, um, Depends where you are. That's true. I'm going to I'm going to come back to this because this is a case right. I'm ready for. And so, <coughs> and so this is the question that, that, that Jim is asking. Jim's sitting right over here. Um, <coughs> <coughs> and, um, no, he's okay. 
<laughs> I'm not sure if he was a graduate or not, but when we started talking about, about paying attention to performative routines and knowledge, basically what the nurses were doing, he said, essentially, I, I, I respect that, but at the end of the day, it's not really relevant because there's a logic process that you can go through whereby the extensive knowledge and routines can be, um, it can be uh, benevolently imposed on frontline staff to get them to do what management wants. There's a book by a... Uh, what's that? Has he ever been in the hospital? <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not sure. But in any case, that's not, it was pretty clear to me he never talked to a nurse. But, <laughs> thank you, yes. But, um, and, and, and to me, that was uh, an example of the old man Sure is. And, and, um, but it's prevalent, um, and it, that's exactly um, the, the message. All right, certainly um, so. There, so is a, there is a book by a, a, a well-known philosopher from Princeton. It's called On Bullshit. Right. So this has become an academic term, so I can use this uh, with, without. Uh, I, I have wasted more of my employer's money. Than all yeah. <laughs> I'll give you the footnote. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that I think that a theory of the organization is essential for our work in design here at Weatherhead, that the theory of the firm is not our theory, that we need to discuss organization very carefully. Um, do you know what an HRO is? An HRO, a high reliability organization? Yeah. Uh, it's an organization that even in catastrophe cannot fail. The examples are a nuclear attack aircraft carrier, um, a nuclear power plant, um, an intensive care unit, and one of the examples given by some of the theorists of HROs is also investment banking, which is stunning. I bring this up because uh, we actually have a case study. We were, there was a conference held at uh, Stern at uh, NYU, and uh, David Van Strelen, who's a doctor, T, uh, working in California uh, at Loma Linda, he told uh, he, a, a case of a pediatric intensive care unit that he took over as manager. And his account, we've published this in Design Issues because to me it's a, it's a brilliant example of a kind of design thinking, what I call fourth order design. My theory of the organization includes different kinds of organizations and the kind that he developed in that pediatric intensive care unit had distributed agency so that nurses were making life and death decisions and he's able to show the justifications in legal uh, judgments that have been rendered that this was acceptable and reasonable and in outcomes. Uh, it's a remarkable case. I've continued to follow the HRO literature because I think that's an example of organization at the breaking point. And it's interesting that in those organizations there is indeed a power and control system. The nuclear attack aircraft carrier is an example. There is a captain and usually an admiral. <coughs> Nonetheless, that person cannot make the decisions that come with the crash of a plane on the deck or a torpedo or a missile. That has to be action taken, did you say intuitive? That has to be action that's taken immediately to deal with that crisis. 
the ability of a manager and an organization to uh, um, explore the possibility of that distribution of agency is a very significant part of what I'm talking about. I, keeping this, I didn't want to bring it up. It's in the background of what I do, but it's there. Um, and that, that case study is, I think, quite interesting. It opens a pathway. They're doing some work on this at Berkeley. There's an excellent uh, person there in the, uh, in the Haas School. Um, but that, to me, would be an example, back to this point, speaking directly of the role of the nurse in this context. Interestingly, when he left, a set of doctors came into that facility and were appalled that nurses could make decisions about the life and death of uh, babies and certainly required that there be evidence-based decision-making. We'll do the tests, and as the tests are being done, the babies die, of course. Um, so it's a, it's a sad tale, and I point to the winter's tale again. It's a tale for us in dealing with uh, self-correcting, self-repairing systems. I think that uh, we've reached a kind of a, 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 an edge on how we talk about systems in design and design in systems, and it's this edge around HROs and this kind of problem that you're, you're raising. Those are at the leading edge of what I think should be a, a, an intense research effort. There are others in other places, but this is one that's, and I just happened to come up here, there are others too. I have a question about uh, the second step in the design piece, where you want to see more robustness. Yes, the process, the actual process of design. Uh, can you say just a, a few pivotal things? I will, okay, thank you. I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I think it's reasonable to do that, because I've, I've suggested that it is robust. Um, and we follow that process with our students. There are, you need to understand, there are probably 185,000 accounts of the design process. And usually there are step models. You do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, and then something magical happens. And that's really, it's so boring. I, I'm interested in the phases. What has to, to be accomplished? Not the steps, but, but what has to be accomplished in order to go forward? And I like to begin that with uh, what, what comes before the brief. And in fact, with our MBA students, we ask them to, oh my goodness, Sorry. that's all right. We, uh, we ask them to write their own brief after a period of intense research. When they look at an organization and see its competition, its competitive positioning, what the issues are in the organization, we ask them then to write a brief uh, as, a, as a manager would. But then they're asked, uh, after a pause, they're asked to take that brief and analyze that brief. Just the, the discussion among the team members what does this brief actually mean? And then to go out and continue the research process to see whether that brief quite captures what they should be working on. We then ask them to go through a process of conceptualization of ideas that might be useful in resolving the issue that's raised in the brief. And typically we ask them to begin to do a process of sketching and prototyping even. We ask them to generate 10 possibilities, 15, I know I work with design students who will generate 20 or 30. Designers work hard. The students here, uh, if they get five, they're, they're yeah. But we're getting there. We're getting better. So we want to generate lots of possibilities. Then we ask them to look for feasibility. Winnow those options down to things that they think would be feasible given the constraints that they may find. Then we ask them to begin to, uh, to focus on one of those or a com maybe build all three and begin to see if there are features that, that can be shared, that, reveal, that are revealed, mm -hmm. and to gradually emerge it as one, one idea. They then begin the process of making, which is very foreign, I think, to MBA students to actually make. So we've had students who are shocked that they would, we, one, in one case that we asked them to, they decided they wanted to build a program. They needed a program. Mm -hmm. How do you design a program? Boy, were they stumped, and I'm trying to figure out why would they be stumped at putting a program together. Well, I've done it for so many years, it's easy for me, but they've actually put together a program. That's their product. And uh, with, that, with that in case, they then have to go out and do some user testing to see if that program will actually work. Test out the premises of that program and the features. Mm -hmm. Are those really the features that are needed? And then there is a process of the development of that the prototype evaluate, prototype evaluate. So now some of my groups are in the third prototype version, getting it better and better as they go. Uh, there is a problem, uh, there's a point that comes for uh, uh, 
time to hand in. Writers call it the sending in day. Sometime you've got to send a manuscript off. Well, and they've got to, they've got to wrap it up within a certain time and begin a preparation for presentation. And in design, you present three things. You present a working prototype. You present a documentation of the process you went through. And you present a feasibility study. And that handoff then is taken into another design process for the implementation. Those are the steps. Now the tools, the techniques, I think we misunderstand sometimes that we think of methods in some narrow way. I think it's a mistake. There are large arts that are strategic in making connections. There are only a few of those arts in our, in our intellectual life. Among the arts though, within the arts, there are many methods. And grounded theory offers some methodology. There are others as well, action of research and so forth. But then within those methods, there are millions, <laughs> it seems, of techniques. A technique is a little bit of business, like um, how you cut a piece of paper or something. Every method has lots of techniques. So you have this, this cascade, strategic arts, operational methods with frameworks that are understood and practiced, usually in other fields as well, and then the billions of techniques that you use to make it actually work. So those are the things that I think are part of the conceptual tools for this. That's a good question. We'll do that, Jeff. What a nice thing for you to say. Thank you. I want to make another observation. One of the criticisms that I've always had of the social sciences yes. is that they teach you how to identify problems, yet I believe give you few skills when it comes to really solving problems and issues. Yes. The value of the MBA program from my 30-year perspective now on it is that what it provided is an analytical deterministic Yes. And solve them. Now, it may have led ultimately to the hardening of the arteries for some organizations. Yes. But I'm looking at now at the next wave. Yes. And how do we as practitioners, again, utilize some of what you've talked about over the last two hours so that we can help our organizations? That's a great observation question. It's in the middle of between the two. I think that's exactly the point that I'm driving at. We do not want to abandon the analytics. I mentioned that every design process begins with an analysis of factors, elements, causes, relationships. The analytic phase is always in design. Research is part of our work. It's the synthetic phase that we've been missing. How do you put together the results of that? And that requires informed intuition, which we've, we've raised again, but that understanding of the synthesis is what we're after. So by no means want to abandon the, the core disciplines of the field here, just as in design in industrial design, ergonomics, you know, we're never gonna do away with that. We need that. Uh, and there are several others in this. Too. Um, how to do this, that's the creative challenge. Because we're, that's how, what's exciting. That's what I'm trying to tell you right now. That's what's exciting. They asked me to come down and say something that might engage you in what we're doing at Weatherhead right now. Well, damn it, this, that's it, what we're trying to do. This is a new way of thinking about business. It's got lots of issues in it, things that we're not resolved on, but it seems to be worth the candle of trying. And I think that's the character of Weatherhead. It's always been a place for new ideas. Yes. For handling the issues and the problems that many of us are dealing with today. And so we've got to find uh, either a new way or at least an incremental improvement on what we have to, to get this going. I think that's exactly the case. And I will conclude with, and then I'll come back to your question, but I want to read this again. This is from The Winter's Tale. Our text for today. This is an art which does mend nature no, not mend, change it rather. But the art itself is nature, the creative power of that art. Now I told you when we began, I, was, I would read that and you wouldn't understand what in the devil I was talking about and that we wouldn't understand it at the end of the lecture, but someplace in the middle there may have been a moment where that was a little bit clearer. <laughs> you had a question. <laughs> Thank you all, you're great. <laughs>